This is Knowledge is Power, hosted by Wendy Carrillo. Thank you for listening. I'm Wendy Carrillo, and this is Knowledge is Power, right here on Power 106. You can follow me on Twitter at Wendy Carrillo, double R, double L, and get a podcast of the show available on my blog on power106.com. Today's point of conversation, it's all about mental health, trauma, how we deal with it, the conversation going on nationally right now throughout the country on Black Lives Matter, what we can do to be involved and really support um, a change in America, which is what we're going to be discussing today. My guest this morning is Dr. Milo Dodson, who is a mental health therapist at the UC Irvine Counseling Center, as well as the camp director for Common Summer Youth Camp. Common, of course, hip-hop artists that we yes. love. So yes. thank you so much for being here, Dr. Dodson. Well, it's definitely a pleasure and an honor. Um, I think this is really, really kind of... Uh, surreal for me. I think I grew up on Power 106. Yeah, I mean, me way, too. way back in the day, going back to Tito's Top 404. <laughs> you know, this, <laughs> this is, is Tito. Tito in La Casa. <laughs> Hone it down for me, Rasa. So all that is, is really surreal to be able to be here with you today and to be able to speak to our brothers and sisters out there. That's so awesome. And thank you for listening. And to all of you, of course, that have grown up with Power 106, like yes. both of you and I have, like it's so great to be able to have these conversations about issues that matter to our community, that matter to both of us, that matter to the many listeners that are impacted by Absolutely. what's happening right now. And Absolutely. so the large the large conversation about Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. police brutality in America. Yes. If you grew up in the hood, like you know, like mm -hmm. you know what this is like. Like I talk to my, my male cousins and they're like, yep, I've been harassed. I've yeah. been stopped by the police, driving while, while brown, driving yes, while black. While black. Yeah, like these yeah. are real things that people experience. Yeah, and it's an unfortunate experience on a regular basis. I think... Fortunately and unfortunately, it's picked up more momentum recently. I think that's just because of the power and the reach of social media. More recently, we've seen this covered on an individual level. But for a while, and we'd be lying to ourselves if we didn't recognize that it's been happening for decades on an institutional and systemic level. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just with the outreach of social media and how many people that touches, we're able to see it on a more regular basis. Um, so yeah, I mean, I go back to high school when I was pulled over. <clears throat> excuse me, when I was pulled over with my mom when I was just riding my bike home from the movies. Mm. And um, you know, the officer, first officer, was cool. I think he was actually flirting with my mom, which is kind of weird for me. Then second officer comes over playing bad cop, and he starts kind of giving me a little bit more of a hard time. Actually, starts harassing me. And he's, um, you know, trying to search me. And he's like, well, do you have anything in, in your pockets that would stab me? I was like, no. He's like... What? He asked if you have anything that you would stab him with? Yeah, like if I had any knives. And he literally said, I kid you not, Wendy, verbatim, do you have any guns, knives, drug paraphernalia, or bazookas in your pocket? And bazookas. I'm thinking like, Baz bazookas? He's like, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes you kids. And I'm just like, oh my God. So anyway, I, I pulled out my stuff. I had like my student ID card and all that kind of stuff. And... Um, it was just a really difficult experience. And this was... How old were you then? Man, probably I was a freshman in high school. So like... 14. 14, 15, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I use that as a brief example of the type of individual difficulties that people have for driving. And at that point, I wasn't even old enough to drive. I was riding my bike home with my mom. So while we're driving, when we're black, while we're walking, when we're just being, we're being harassed. And that's not just by police. That's by people in different positions of power who think that somehow the color of our skin, our racial heritage make us less than human and mm -hmm. that we can just be criminalized and harassed that way. Um, and like I said, it's been going on for, for way too long. Well, the issue of how social media plays a role in the larger conversation, and it's it yeah. seems like every day... There's a new name, uh, a new hashtag. Yes. And it's unfortunate that we've politicized those hashtags, like mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter, and one sure. does not negate from the other. Right. Uh, saying Black Lives Matter does not mean that everybody else's lives doesn't. It no, just means no, no. that we have to understand that the, real the reality is that black people in America are harassed more than everybody else. Mm -hmm. There are more blacks and uh, Latinos. Sure. Uh, incarcerated, right? 
proportionally mm -hmm. than anybody else in this country. And so that's a very real thing that people experience, and you can't take that away from the reality of it. No, no, I think a couple points there. One, the Black Lives Matter movement is more, by its very nature, inclusive and, and strives to be inclusive. The founders... Um, have made it a point to say, you know, once the black trans woman is free, then we'll all be free. And that's the origins of Black Lives Matter. Uh, I mean, it started from that uh, momentum. It started from that inspiration back when Trayvon Martin was murdered. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be very intentional about how we're using Black Lives Matter to recognize that it's inclusive. Like I said, it's not exclusive. People try to counter Black Lives Matter by saying all lives matter. And that's the very point of why we need to explicitly and specifically say Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> we've seen historically all lives have been, or uh, not just all lives, different people in power as a position, their lives have been intentionally included in the conversation and they've been the ones who have uh, written history and the narrative. And, well, those and, empower write history, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think... The, the importance of saying Black Lives Matter is to include all voices, is to include the marginalized communities. Um, and so the, the counter of All Lives Matter just, it's like, yeah, we know, that's the point. So right now, we're just going to focus and kind of highlight the importance of Black Lives Matter and to be inclusive in, in doing so. so. The many names that have been in the media recently, we have Sam Dubose, mm -hmm. Sam Dubose mm -hmm. Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Ethel Ford, Mike Brown, yes, Eric Garner, Rakita Boy, and Trayvon Martin are just some of the few that seem to bubble up to the surface because there's been people that have taken cell phone footage. Yes. Like we're seeing a different narrative because how important cell phone footage has played in these conversations. Absolutely. Whether if the cell phone footage wasn't available, mm -hmm. would the story be different? Yeah, well, the the first part of that, before we get into the cell phone footage, um, I think it's important to for me to really highlight the, the shirt that I'm wearing in the studio today. Um, on my shirt, there's nine folks who have been killed, murdered, harassed um, by uh, racism, by police brutality, going back, and, and just a general sense of racism, going back to Emmett Till, uh, and also included on this shirt is Mike Brown. And I think I would be remiss and really, really um, naive to the fact that today, this is the one year anniversary of when Mike Brown was murdered in Ferguson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. August 9th. August 9th, yes, 2014. Rest in peace, Brother Mike. And it, I feel all these folks' spirits in the in the studio here today. I feel Oscar Grant. I feel Trayvon Martin. I feel Mike Mike Brown. And it's important to recognize that there's only so many shirts that we can continue to make. There's only so many hashtags that we can continue to be seen on social media. Like this shirt is more of a, should be more of a scroll. Like we roll out the scroll of all the names of the brothers and sisters who have been murdered and harassed and, and killed by racism, by police brutality, by oppression. And I, I get so, so worked up talking about it because there's at what point do we actually start to make policy change at what point do we actually start to make systemic and institutional change like hashtag raising awareness all that is amazing but that's only the beginning we really need to see more sustainable change yeah and it's very outsider looking in you yes, can have yes. as many protests as you want you can and they make an impact no absolutely they do yes but also how do you have the conversation within Right. How do you talk to your elected official? How do you hold them accountable? How do you create change mm -hmm. um, in a in an issue that's been so ongoing for so long? Right. And only now are we seeing like this is the new civil rights movement in many ways. Yeah. And and it was what 1964 when mm -hmm. um, freedom Freedom Summer occurred, right? Like right before the the um, the signing of the Civil Rights Act. Right. So now. You know, the NAACP is actually doing something, a march, an 860-mile march from Selma, Montgomery to D.C., calling it Justice Summer. Justice Summer. Justice right? Summer yeah. to raise awareness about all these all these issues, police brutality, these names, like this has got to stop. Yeah, and it's interesting that the juxtaposition of about 50 years ago when we we know the same thing that's happening now was happening then. Mm -hmm. The only difference 
is that we have social media in the way that we have it now. And we have police body cams. We have uh, cameras on police cars, um, dashboards. But that's only the beginning. Once you see these things going on, it's like, okay, well, what do you actually do to affect change within these police departments? Mm -hmm. What do you actually do to affect the policy and the institutional racism that's inherent in our country and has been inherent since the 1700s? Um, I think trying to draw parallels like yeah it's important because we've seen police brutality we've all seen those pictures of dogs being put on protesters in the 60s we've seen fire hydrants being unleashed on protesters in the 60s you've seen pretty much the same thing more recently in the last couple years Mm -hmm. and unfortunately i'm sure we're going to see something similar uh, in the in the very near future. Case in point, a couple of days ago, Christian Taylor was murdered out in Dallas, I believe, as a young brother, as a, a college football player. How many more hashtags are we going to need to see? How much more footage do we need to see? The, the change that we're trying to make needs to be more than just symbolic change. It mm-hmm. needs to be policy policy change and institutional change. My guest this morning is Dr. Milo Dotson, who is a mental health therapist at the UC Irvine Counseling Center, as well as the camp director for Commons Summer Youth Camp, as we're discussing some of the very issues that are impacting our society right now and have been for many, many, many years. I wanted to read a little something sure. um, regarding Mike Brown mm-hmm. and policy changes as well in, in Ferguson, because okay. after... After the uprising in Ferguson from last year, uh, there have been changes, and the new a new electorate rose up. Mm -hmm. People were registering to vote. A community which was mostly African American and policed by a white police force, as well as uh, the local uh, city council was mostly white, has changed dramatically. And the Department of Justice came in and and saw that the police department was obviously very uh, racist in their practices Mm -hmm. and that's been documented and so that's that's changed uh local community members african americans ran for office one Mm -hmm. have changed the dynamic of ferguson so it took an act so gruesome like the death of mike brown and the uprising to change that right but uh since it is august uh, 9th Mm -hmm. the one year anniversary uh, the New Yorker had an interview mm-hmm. with Officer Darren Wilson, who uh, shot Mike Brown. Right. And they asked him what he thought about the whole situation. And he said, and I'm quoting, do I think about who he was as a person? Not really, because it doesn't matter at this point. Do I think he had the best uh, upbringing? No, not at all. Oh, man. Yeah, I... Uh, you know, it, it breaks my heart and infuriates me every time I hear the continued narrative and the continued privilege for people who have committed these acts. I think it, it's heartbreaking to think about that even in his death, that Mike Brown isn't receiving or his humanity isn't even being recognized. There's no remorse. It doesn't seem like from this quote, it, there hasn't been remorse from Officer Wilson throughout the the last year and i think humanity the humanity of folks of color the humanity of marginalized communities is the first to go i think particularly for for black folks we've seen our our likeness we've seen our worth be more about our uh us as property us as culture people can wear, try to, you know, have hair like black people. People can try to have particular music to emulate and to appropriate our culture. Mm. But there's no remorse or recognition of our humanity. Furthermore, we continue to hear stories by folks in positions of power and privilege, but we don't hear as many stories from Mike Brown's parents, Mike Brown's family. We heard up and down, you know, day after day, hour after hour from Zimmerman, right, a couple of years ago. And we even continue. I'm surprised he doesn't have he doesn't have a reality show yet. Right. George Zimmerman, who shot Trayvon Martin. Yeah. And we continue to hear his story be told. We continue to see interviews from him because somehow it's more about listening to the folks in, in these positions of power. But what about the survivors? What about the victims? I mean, they're... Uh, 
speaking about hashtags again, the reason why we need to hashtag say her name is because Sandra Bland isn't getting the same type of respect and, and her humanity recognized like Officer Wilson is continuing to be able to share his story. Right. Um, Sandra Bland, who was pulled over by a police officer, thrown to the ground, was in prison, died in prison, has been said that she allegedly committed suicide. Right. Uh, and you're absolutely right. It's what happens to her story. Yes. And I think, furthermore, as we're talking about Black Lives Matter and recognizing the, the origins by these amazing, amazing sisters, I think there's even somehow a, a, a hint of male privilege in the, the way that social media portrays all these murders and all these killings that we tend to see at times uh, the deaths of young brothers highlighted, but we also need to pay attention to the deaths of our sisters out there. We also need to pay attention to the deaths of transgender women because even with the, like I said, even with gender, there's still a slight bit of privilege there. And that really needs to be deconstructed. Um, myself, you know, doing a lot of research about masculinity, being able to speak at various conventions and conferences about masculinity, specifically about black masculinity. I think it's important to both talk about the the way that masculinity is constructed, but then actively work to deconstruct it. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that we can have a marginalized identity, i.e. your racial background for African Americans, but then also your gender identity, which is separate, can be um, a position of, of privilege. Mm -hmm. So myself as an African American man, a lot of people may see gender as being more prominent to them. But then also I think it's important to recognize, okay, at the same time, there's this marginalized identity. So, um, yeah. The intersections. Inter man, intersectionality is no joke. Uh -huh. Like that needs to be at the forefront of this discussion about race. It's, it's so important. So many layers. Layers on top of layers, racks on racks of, <laughs> of identities. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And then even you can bring about like the issue of identity and um, your status in the country, whether you're documented or undocumented. Absolutely. And it's not just the Latino issue. We were having a conversation about about this very issue with some other friends and it was like, well, what if you are a transgendered woman of color that's undocumented in this country? Mm. And the issue of like, well, if you are transgender, do you get placed in a male facility? Right, right, right. And what are the dangers of that? And if you and that's actually happening right now. Mm -hmm. Like in in several detention centers across the country sure. where that is is an issue and it's something that also the government is, is looking at but there's so many things there's so many things and they're all so important at the same time and i think recently i was writing a reflection about the need for folks to really um like i, I wanted to introduce them to the power of and is what mm -hmm. it came down to i think at some point we have to be able to be advocates for multiple um multiple movements recognizing that it's all one movement in the same thread and that we're all connected in, in some form or fashion mm -hmm. and being able to embrace others differences in a way that is done through love um, fighting for justice because we pray for peace and when you're talking about um, these you know various intersections when you're talking about the combination of our identities that's what we're talking about, being able to come together to fight against oppression, to fight against violence in a way that, for me, promotes love. So, Well, Martin Luther King said, right, an injustice to one is an injustice to all. Yes. And embracing that. Absolutely. And Dr. King also said that riots are the voice of the, or the yeah, riots are the voice of the unheard. Mm -hmm. So being able to hold on to both of those simultaneously, being able to fight literally to fight for justice in the way that you need to because you pray for peace. Fighting isn't something that inherently needs to be violent, mm -hmm. at least for me. I still think that there's a way to be uh, peaceful in protests. Um, but again, at the same time, we recognize that at a certain point, riots are the voice of the unheard. So, 
My guest this morning, if you're just tuning in, is Dr. Milo Dotson, who is a mental health therapist at UC Irvine Counseling Center, as well as the camp director for Common Summer Youth Camp. And you can find him at Twitter, at P-H Dotson. That's D-O-D-S-O-N. Yes, ma'am. Right? Yes. And at me, at Wendy Carrillo, double R, double L, and let us know what you think. And as always, we're running quickly out of time, sure. which I wish we could have this conversation longer, and we can definitely do that. But I want to, in the work that you do with young people... Mm-hmm. How do you have these conversations? How do you address issues of trauma? Like it is mm. not normal to have violent deaths happening in your neighborhood every mm. day. No. But pe- young people and adults have gotten accustomed to that. And in fact, UCLA had a study some years ago that said that kids that grow up in the inner city mm-hmm. uh, are more prone to trauma and PTSD than soldiers coming back from the war in Iraq. Yes. Because they see death every day. Yeah, so seeing death every day is not a normal circumstance for anyone. War is not a normal circumstance for anyone. So when we're talking about the symptoms and the symptomatology of post-traumatic stress disorder, UCLA, that study, um, my PhD is from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is about two hours south of Chicago. Hospitals up in Chicago, we've seen kids coming in there with the same symptoms of PTSD as you were talking about soldiers coming back from war. So we talk about these things by being able to take the role as a a mentor, as a parent, as a teacher, as a loved one, just someone who's making sure that the young folks know that we hear them. I think first and foremost, we want to make sure that we validate and affirm that, hey, this is not normal. This isn't something that you should have to deal with on a regular basis. So how can I consistently show love for them? How can I consistently show that I'm being an authentic and genuine loved one to be able to provide ongoing support? And I think by doing that, young folks are extremely, extremely talented on their uh, their BS meter. So they mm-hmm. know that if you're trying to fake the funk and just trying to say like, hey, let me go talk to him just because I think I, I should, they're going to know and they're going to pick up on that. So it's going to be important to, like I said, continuously have an authentic approach to connecting with them, affirming, validating their emotions um, and, and letting them know like, hey, it's okay to cry. Um, I think that's, again, as we were talking about masculinity earlier, that's masculinity is a lie that needs to be deconstructed. You're not strong just because you can hold back your tears. You're not strong just because you need to try to hit somebody or shoot somebody to try to show like, Hey man, like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take this pow pow. Like that's not, that's not the way that needs to work. We need to actually be able to find strength in being vulnerable and Mm -hmm. find strength in being able to open up to others. That's what it means to be strong. And that's what you tell young people at the camp or in the talks that you do at the university? Yeah, absolutely. Or across I mean, the country? Yeah, whether I'm in individual therapy or doing individual therapy with uh, undergrads and grad students at Irvine in an individual setting, a group setting, whether I'm working with the Common Ground Foundation students, um, we just came back from camp like a week and a half, two weeks ago. I'm still recovering from all these mosquito bites. <laughs> um, being able to show them that I'm there to support them and not just support them, but being able to give them a space to be vulnerable. Uh, we have breakout sessions for the, for the boys, we have breakout sessions for the girls, and then we all come together um, as a big camp, like 40, 45 young folks from Chicago who have, a lot of the time has never been, have never been outside of the city. Right. We take them to Wisconsin to you know, be, be connected with nature. Uh, and I think more importantly, be connected with each other Mm. because they don't have the opportunity to really do that too often. Get out of that concrete jungle. The concrete jungle and into the mosquitoes and into, (laughs) into the wilderness and make s'mores and, you know, have some cafeteria food. It's be kids, man, just be kids. Yeah, a lot of kids grow up too soon. And I love on the website, commongroundfoundation.org, common hip-hop artist that we love and a friend of Power 106, he wrote wrote right on the front page and said, I started the Common Ground Foundation because I wanted to help, most of all, help people help themselves. Mm -hmm. So you're setting those foundations at an early age. Yeah. You know, your maturity level, your mind is still growing. Yes. You can still create a lot of difference in the life of a young person. What has been the common thread that you see across young people that you help and like the issues that they're facing? 
I really think that young people just want to be heard and want to be told that, hey, you know what? I'm good enough. I'm deserving. Mm. And I think for me, and I'm not going to lie, like I'm, I'm 29. Like I'm getting old com- <laughs> compared to these kids. Um, Four, 16. Yeah. Well, they tell me, like, oh, Dr. Dodson, you're 29. My goodness. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get Social Security pretty soon. <laughs> but anyway, I think for me, the, the common thread is that they want to be heard and they want to be told that people value their lives because there's so many messages there's so many images out there that are contradictory to that innate sense of value Mm -hmm. so i try to connect with them if they want to talk about anything from rap to to poetry to making masks um doing yoga out there it's all grounded in love and i see that same uh that same thing represented like i was starting to say for me as a 29 year old that i just finally had an epiphany it being that it's not about what i do but about who i am that gives me value and that's inherent no matter what i'm doing no matter what i did no what i no matter what i'm about to do it's inherent that's never going to be taken away even if yeah. i try to take it away myself in the sense that i'm trying to deny myself my self-worth and not recognizing the love that I have for myself, no matter what happens, it's always there. So I just, I I try to work with Common. I try to work with all of our other counselors and instructors to really allow students to love themselves. It's about living with dignity. Yeah, and and dignity and and self-respect and and self-love and self-compassion. I mean, it's it's a transforming uh, foundation. It's a transforming mentoring program. And camp is just a small snapshot of the amazing work that we do year round for these kids. Well, as we're running out of time, any final words from you? What do we? What can we expect from you moving forward? Absolutely. So, in a couple years, uh, I'll be working on everything from a book talking about uh, self love, self discovery, leadership, family. Um, so, the first step for me is going to be publishing this book, um, and then being able to use this book. It's going to be called Black at Eighteen, talking about my own development as a African American, as a biracial. Um, you know, kid growing up in Covina, California. The suburbs. The sub, yeah, about 25 miles east of LA. Um, so after the book, the next big chapter in my life is going to be starting a TV show. So I'll be covering everything from social justice to community activism to, like I said, leadership building, um, and most importantly, talking about mental health mm. in a way that normalizes and destigmatizes mental health. Like a cooler Dr. Phil. Man, a, <laughs> like a way cooler Dr. Phil. Like there, I'm not going to have a thick mustache like that. Right. Um, no I, Texas accent. No, no Texas accent. I think I'm going to be connecting with my guests on the show in a much more genuine and authentic way. My natural style isn't really to get up in people's face and to to try to take this sensationalized view or this approach to talking about mental health. We're going to have very real, genuine conversations grounded in love, and I'm not going to try to use scare tactics. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's going to also be a little bit more educational and entertaining. I'll have different guests. Obviously, Common's going to be invited. Shout Mm -hmm. out to Common out there. (laughs) Um, Be able to have... Everyone from hopefully the the president, Mrs. Obama, uh, yoga instructors, physicians, all these different folks coming together to talk about wellness and just being being great, being Mm -hmm. excellent um, based off of who you are as a person and not just like I said, not just about what you're doing. Yeah, a great friend of mine told me that your body, soul, and mind should all work succinct. They should all work together to move you forward. There's so many things that are blocking us, whether it's, you know, uh, just like a block about how good you are or how, you know, lack or you're lacking in something. We always feel like we look at the negative and not the positive of how great just being alive can be. Yeah, and it's such a important shift in perspective that needs to be taken a lot of the time, myself included, that it's not just about the difficulties that you're having. You can recognize the difficulties, but then also what are you going to be able to do moving forward? How do you support yourself? How do you reach out for support? How do you allow yourself to be open to receiving support in all those different ways, spiritually, 
psych- psychologically, mentally, physically, all these different ways that we're talking about a holistic approach to wellness. Um, so that's what the show is going to be dedicated towards. Um, like I said, folks right now can find more information on my website, phdodson.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter or Instagram at phdodson. Thanks for coming on to the show. It's a pleasure and an honor. My guest this morning has been Dr. Milo Dotson, who is a mental health therapist at the UC Irvine Counseling Center, as well as the camp director for Common Summer Youth Camp. I'm Wendy Carrillo, and this is Knowledge is Power right here on Power 106. You can follow me at Twitter and let me know what you think at Wendy Carrillo, double R, double L, and get a podcast of the show available on power106.com. Thanks for listening. Power 106, baby. Where hip hop lives. Love and be loved.